Hey, do you teach yoga? Have you ever trained to lead yoga classes to be a yoga therapist? Have you ever owned a yoga studio? Maybe even just wondered what it was like for the women and men up there in front of the room on their mats, leading you through endless Surya Namaskars, down dogs, and pranayamas galore? Well, these are their stories and mine. I'm Rebecca Sebastian, a 20-year yoga teacher, 10-year yoga therapist, yoga studio owner, and co-founder of a yoga-focused nonprofit. I've done a lot in the yoga world over the last 20 years, pretty much everything except had a water cooler. You know, a place to share stories, talk about struggles, successes, and find other people who do the same thing that I do. Welcome to Working in Yoga, a podcast and substitute water cooler for yoga folks to connect and build community, to share our unique profession, our challenges, and our journeys with the world. Hey friends, welcome to Working in Yoga. This week is one of my favorite episodes that I've recorded this season with my friend Tanya Converse. Now, Tanya is a spiritual teacher and she and I dive deep into our thoughts about the yoga industry and especially about the us versus them mentality that I know I have been cultivating for years. I'm trying to back myself out of that thinking to really look at all of us as a whole. And this conversation with Tanya actually was so influential in my thinking on that. So I think you're really going to love it. I can't wait to hear from you all about what you think. So here we go. Welcome friends to working in yoga. Okay, so I cannot tell you the amazing conversation I had before I pressed record with my friend Tanya Converse. And Tanya, tell everybody who you are, and then we're just going to (laughs) talk. Excellent. Hi, Rebecca. It's a joy to be here. And um, my name is Tanya Converse, and I am the creative force behind a soulful space. That's my that's my um, my person, my persona, if you will, right? My professional persona. And uh, I am an energetic, intuitive, and spiritual mentor who comes to all of this work through yoga. So yoga is a key part of what I do. Um, and it is, it was my first home for really beginning to unpack some of the you know crap that I carried forward from being raised in this culture, being raised as a woman, all of the things. And, um, and now it's my joy to uh, work with women in supporting them and coming home to themselves as, um, as I like to say it, as radiant sovereign souls. Because ultimately I think yoga is a liberation practice and it's all ultimately about sovereignty, so. Hell yeah, it is. Yes. <laughs> okay. So before I pressed record, Tanya and I were talking about a couple things and I'm going to slide us back into a conversation that I said that it's this thing that's burning in my brain, this idea that those of us who started yoga in the nineties and early two thousands, we need to grieve what was the yoga industry? What was our experience of yoga in those, in the nineties, in the early two thousands, because that part of our industry doesn't exist. And I see us as the holdup, right? Because we're clearly, COVID set us on fire. We are burned to the nails. The house is down. We only have the nails left. And it's our job, our responsibility to co-create the future of what our industry is. And talk to me a little bit about how you feel about this grief process. You and I are both in our forties. So we've been at this for a while. How do you feel about where we were, where we're going. Yeah, so interestingly, I've been at this for a little over a decade as a teacher. Um, and uh, as I said before, I was, um, I was an active duty Marine when I first was introduced to yoga. So yoga has always been, it's always held this place of like a balancer for me from this hierarchical kind of um, action oriented world right, that I occupied professionally. And so it was like my personal retreat <laughs> all the time, every time I went to a, a yoga class. And, and so that sense of, um, I think you called it like that counterculture yeah. sort of aspect to it is it's falling away. Um, I can remember a few years ago, the moment that I 
was like, wow, yoga is everywhere now was a, um, a print ad I saw for a washing machine, right? A washer and dryer in which the woman was in dancer pose, dropping a piece of clothing yeah. into something, right? And I was just like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as you said, you know, I ultimately, I think it's the fires of transformation that COVID offered us, right? It, I think the house was already burning personally. Same. Um, and COVID just sort of threw some gas on it, right? It made it like the fire. I think before a lot of us were standing with the fire behind us and we were looking in the other direction, like what, what fire? I, I don't, I don't see a fire. Is it, is it warm and, in here? Yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, throwing stuff over our shoulders that fed the fire <laughs> and yep. still in denial that the fire was happening. And, you know, COVID just made it a blue hot supernova. Yeah. And we just couldn't look away anymore. And um, interestingly, like you chose really interesting words to me to say that like the nails are what's left. Right. And I, I think that's it. It's the, that's where the alchemical process can really happen when you're left with just the connective tissue. And, and that's where we're at right now. Like we are left with the connective tissue and we absolutely have a right to feel however we feel about it. Right. Like good, bad, like I was not celebrating that print ad. I'll tell you, I was not, right. I was not feeling like, woohoo, look at us. Yoga has arrived in that moment. Um, and I have since really had to sit with myself and say, okay, I can look at that and allow that while, while that like makes my belly flip a little bit, um, it's also cause for celebration because that means yoga is reaching more people. The, this practice that I ultimately like, despite myself became a teacher of, because I wanted to share it. So like, it just burned in me and burned through yeah. me in such a way that I like, didn't feel like I had a choice really. And, um, and just how, how beautiful it is that more people are, are thinking, oh, well, maybe yoga is an option. Um, in our conversation earlier, you were talking about how, you know, like you get referrals now from yeah. places and sectors you never would have thought that you'd get a referral from before. And I get clients who come and they say, you know, I just feel calmer when I'm around you. And I've tried everything else to tackle my relationship with food or my relationship with whatever. And, and I'm like, that's not really what I do. And they're like, but I think you can help me. And I'm like, all right, let's try. Let's, let's walk together for a while and see what yeah. happens. And that's, that's just gorgeous, right? Like that, that potential, um, is it's a beautiful thing. And we are all just amazingly positioned to, to help that potential turn into something just beautiful and blossom rather than another fire. Yeah. I mean, Ooh, you've said so many things that I want to highlight, but it's, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Like before we were standing in a house that was on fire, we were just all facing, we were looking out the window instead of looking inside. Yeah. And, and saying we were, our mantras of protection, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And we were really, we were house divided even at that time. Oh. You know, I remember, and I've talked about this before, really when I started to explore finding people who were deconstructing what yoga was within the, within the yoga industry, the space, when we were talking about injuries, you know, 2016, 2017, we were talking about how everybody was getting injured in our rooms and major teachers were having hip surgeries and that was sort of kept, you know, hush, hush. We weren't talking about how we were hurting our bodies. And then we kind of unpacked all of that. And even at that time, I was watching a house divided, you know, there was one camp that was really there to throw stones. And I, I tend to slide into that side, the stone, the, the camp that's going to, you know, lob the cleverly crafted, you know, criticism in the right direction. And the other camp that was very much like, Hey, don't we all want to love each other kind of thing. And, and now all of that is just burned down. And I do think sometimes folks from one side or the other think, 
oh well good there's there's fewer of us here and i was like we have no idea if the good people stayed <laughs> we have we have no idea if the people who care about cultural appropriation who care about sharing as you said earlier the full spectrum of yoga with people we have no idea how many of us are left and at the same time we're still you know those of us as we talked about on the spiritual side are lobbing stones at the fitness yoga folks we need them. We need them. They're doing nothing wrong. Nope. Right. Like I actually want to circle back to, um, to a, to a, something you said, right. Did the good people stay? There are no good people. Right. Right. There are no bad people. Like we're all just people. And if we are, and if we want to really go meta with it, right. We are all the same. Like we are part of oneness, right? So we are, you know, the divine experiencing the divine experiencing the divine experiencing the divine and the the kind of asana only fitness pro side of yoga um they plant seeds that we get to harvest that we little tiny yeah. seedlings pop up from some of the seeds that they've planted and they become the people who need us right who are curious, who are, they want more. They see that there is a whole world beyond the, the poses and the perfection and the, you know, pretty well curated Instagram grid. And, um, and they, they want to understand the whole mud of the Lotus and the Lotus. And, um, and so we need them because those people, as I said earlier, you know, like, we cause people's hair to light on fire sometimes, right? Like there yes. are some beginners who are just not like the ground has not been prepped in any way, shape or form for us to pop in a room and start talking about dissolving the binary, right? I heard myself saying this at a free <laughs> class I was teaching recently. I do a, I do a summer with the, um, a local state park. And, uh, and so I teach a monthly class there as a, as a, as a, it's, it's my karma yoga. Yeah. And, um, and the words came out of my mouth and I was like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Not sure this was the venue, <laughs> but then I'm like, Didn't read oh, the well, here we go. <laughs> like I can't show up as not fully me. Yeah. And, um, so <laughs> there I am. Uh, but at the same time, like I'm observing myself thinking, yikes. And, um, but nobody <laughs> flinched. I mean, nobody got up and left anyway, which they totally could have, it's outside. Um, and, and maybe that's a seed I planted somewhere. That's all, I just have to trust. I, at this point in my life, I just trust. But, and at the same time, those seeds that the, that the asana focused folks are planting with people, you know, that's the fruit that we ultimately get to harvest. And so I'm incredibly grateful to them. Um, I also used to stand on the other side of the line, like, all huffy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm recovering from that side. <laughs> and um, and I just had to remind myself that, you know, a lot of the folks who ultimately ended up wanting to be kind of closer to the fire, so to speak, right? Who were willing to to get kind of in there and see what was happening, they had been prepped by someone else. So is it possible, do you think? as both of us being recovering judgy yoga folks. I, that's what I call myself. I don't know about you, but I definitely, I was in there. I love a good fight online. I, I was I was fighting the good fight about how we all needed to stop doing the bad stuff and only teach the real yoga and lobbying. I was, I'm a good stone thrower when I want to be and I'll own that. But is it possible for us as an industry to instead shift of, us versus them to we are an ecosystem because what you've described as an ecosystem where someone's planting the seeds someone is harvesting the fruit and all of us are in this larger ecosystem of yoga do you think it's possible for us maybe <laughs> Well, honestly, that's the expression of yoga through yoga, isn't it? What you just described. Yeah. It's like the ultimate expression yes. of the yoga <laughs> through all of us as yoga practitioners 
and teachers and holders of the of the wisdom and of the flame. So yes, I have to believe it's possible or the yoga is not real, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah. at the same time, I think it will take conscious effort and intentional um, work on a lot of our parts, um, especially those of us who, who hold the flame of the, the full spiritual practice or of the spiritual practice, right? And, and that's not to say like, I know that I will continue to evolve and that my understanding of yoga and the wisdom tradition of yoga and all the things, the, what that full spectrum yoga is, um, what it is to me today, what I could describe to you today, the meanings that I might um, assign to it today, I can hold absolutely as truth that we could stop this conversation and five minutes later, I might think something completely different. Right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And it's not because I'm flaky. Um, I think it's just, it's the nature of the process. It is as we evolve, our understanding of it all involve, evolves too, I, you know, and, and I'll say that there had to have been a time in my teaching career where, I mean, I don't want to admit it, but I, I might've been one of the, I was never the fitness pro yogi. I would do have to say that, like, that's just not where I come from Same. Um, Same. on it. And that's not what my teachers, you know, so it, it, by the good graces of all that is um, divine, that is not the nature of yoga that I was exposed to, even in my earliest time. Um, and yet I can look back, I can think back to some things that I know I did in a studio room with people that I'm like, I would not do today. <laughs> you know, choices I just would not make, um, emphasis that I would not place now. Um, I wouldn't even think of it now that I certainly did yeah. in the past. So, you know, that's been part of my evolution as a, as a teacher. And that is so incredibly informed by my personal journey as well. And I think sometimes that's where we can get a little lost is um, when we step into the role of teacher, we, we start to take it on as this is all a professional journey now. Um, or it's all, I don't even know, a lot of us don't often think of ourselves as professionals in yoga, which is in a whole other side conversation. Um, but we can think of it as the journey we're taking as a teacher, and we can yeah. feel like we're shedding the role of student. And the, the student space is where I learn the most. And that's especially true when I am both teacher and student at the same time. I learned so much from people I work with. And so that has taken me time, right? Like to, to dissolve the binary of teacher student and instead allow myself to show up as both the leader and the led within the circle is, um, you know, that took time and conscious effort. And it was like the greatest gift I ever gave to myself and my teaching because I'm, it doesn't exhaust me anymore. Like yeah. teaching to me now is it's just a gift. Every time I, I can go in exhausted, you know, I can start like all worried about yeah. whatever's going on in life. And I walk out of there always more fed. Yeah. And that was not always the case, right? Like I could burn myself out because then it was more performative. It was more me trying to kind of hold all the answers and like be all the things and um, be the yoga, right? And there was a point I don't even know when anymore, um, where that all started to dissolve. And I was like, I am not the point here ever. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm never the point. Yes. And once I got out of my own way, uh, suddenly a yes. whole new world opened up to me in terms of my relationship to the practice, to the people, to the business, to the, to the, all of it. And so I'm incredibly grateful for whatever, whoever pushed me over that threshold. <laughs> I remember in my teaching going through that too, of the, it, when I was a teacher at one point, and, a, and it, honestly, it was eight, nine, 10 years in where I consciously as a teacher removed myself from my students' practice. 
I no longer brought a mat to stand on in the front of the room. So they weren't looking at that space for me. I stopped making anything about me and allowing it to be a gift that I was sharing with my students. And it, I, I do think when you're in this long enough, you do start to realize that when that teacher student role sort of integrates a little bit, as you've said, uh, you, you do remove yourself from it. It's not, it's not about you. I remember even early on learning that I would teach a class and think, oh, I just nailed that class. I did such a good job. And everybody would say, bye, thanks, see you next time, and just wander out the door. And then another day I would come in and I would be like, that was, I said so many dumb things today like like some stupid something like that I heard or read in a book and then people would come up to me and be like that was the most meaningful class you've ever taught and I was like what <laughs> seriously then I would then finally I came to the conclusion oh it's not about me their experience has nothing to do with me at all nope yeah right and it doesn't it free you though so let's add, oh yeah, it, it is, it's the best. It is, I encourage all of the teachers at my studio, like if you can make it into that space where you can make it not about you in any way, like remove your, just talk a lot and see what you can offer. It's such a joy because then yoga becomes a gift. And that's part of, that's always been my philosophy with the business is that we aren't selling actual yoga. I'm not selling yoga. Yoga isn't the point of commodification. Like why someone gives me money is not for yoga. Yoga is free. It's been for, it was a gift from my teachers to me, for me to my students. So now we have to talk about commodification and business in a different way yeah. and frame it in a spiritual practice. Like how hard is that, Tanya? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know when I figure it out. <laughs> it's dumb. What are we doing here? <laughs> it's because yeah, right. Oh my gosh, there's so many. I, mean, I we have this ecosystem, uh, right? But money, actual commodity, is in our ecosystem. Yeah, and. Oh, yeah we have to pay bills, right? Like we are having the human experience. Like we, and this is one of those really interesting sticky spaces that we often don't have real conversations about, right? There's the, there's the perception of the, quote unquote, love and light, spiritual side of yoga. Um, and how, if I just keep showing up, you know, my needs will be met and all of that. I totally agree with that and completely disagree with it at the same time. Right. Mostly in the way that we walk it out. Um, because it's not all love and light. It's, it's yes, puppies and rainbows and butterflies. Um, and th this is earth, right? This is nature is, is, um, she's a lens that I often work through things with, right? Uh, she's like one of my greatest co-conspirators. And when you step out onto earth and into earth and into nature, Yes, there's beauty, there's rainbows, there are butterflies, there are, you know, it was pouring here yesterday and I have these cosmos that are blooming right now and they looked like they were dancing in the rain, right? Because they're so light and delicate and it was, it was beautiful. And I have a cat that kills like everything he can get his mouth on, right? Like uh, the same there's flooding as a result of those same rains. There's, there's, there's violence, there's tragedy, there's difficulty. Um, the common metaphor in yoga is the, the lotus and the mud. And it doesn't serve anyone for us to ignore the mud for the lotus, nor the lotus for the mud. Um, 
And so how can we be with and trust ourselves, honestly, is what I kind of think it comes back to, is how can we be in such an honest and loving relationship with ourselves that we can trust ourselves to not just be with and be present to all of it, but to also vocalize it, share it, represent it out into the world. And if we're not doing that, right, if we're cherry picking and only the very best moments, that carefully curated Instagram grid um, of life, right, either on Instagram or off, um, then we're doing a disservice ultimately to ourselves and to the students, the people who, you know, kind of gather near us because we're denying a really huge part of the human experience when we're only allowing for what feels good, what is working, um, what, and sometimes what is working does not feel good. And what do you do with that? Right? Great. I built a yoga business. It's making money and I hate myself for it because it's, <laughs> it's exploitative or it's whatever, right? Like by the traditional markers of, you know, this exploitative capitalist system that we live in, it's a success, right? And at the same time, you can feel in your heart that this is, this is not success. In my case, I had a brick and mortar and um, it was financially not viable, right? Like it was absolutely on life support and I had to let it go. And I also had to acknowledge that while it was a, by the capitalist <laughs> measures, not a success, the, the vision and the mission that I went in there with wasn't, wasn't about, like, I did want it to be financially sustainable. Obviously it was a business. <laughs> um, but the real things I wanted to do were build community, make a, make a space for people who would not normally feel welcomed into a, a yoga practice who might feel like yoga was, you know, to whatever for them, or they were to whatever for yoga, um, that they had a place. And that, by that measure, it was 100% like awesomely successful and it totally failed and I had to close it. Um, it and if I was attached to the binary thinking of this is a success or a failure, then I kind of, I would have been inclined to sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater and not acknowledge where the successes had happened, where the beauty had grown, right? The fruit that had actually made it all the way to ripeness to be harvested. Um, and so I think that there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to, <sighs> you know, to, to walking this walk and yeah. building businesses and professions around it, right? Livelihoods, right? Trying to pay our bills and eat food. <laughs> <laughs> we ask for so much. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so ever find, and this is actually how, so for those of us listening, Tanya and I belong to group again every once in a while shout out hey marvelous because <laughs> we are both have the same business coaches and um when we were in our community you're talking about how i feel like we can never sometimes get away from evolution because what some people don't realize is running a business is is unpacking all of your stuff in the same way that is all about unpacking all of your stuff. So oftentimes it feels like some days I just don't want to spiritually evolve. As I said earlier, some days I would just rather thank you, scroll TikTok and eat chips. And it just is one of those things that I feel like we as yoga professionals have to create really solid boundaries and really slide into our own practice in a way that keeps us grounded 
and and how do you feel about that? Because I think you had such smart, a, such a smart answer when we were chatting about that. So I want you to talk more about that now. What did I say before? No. <laughs> <laughs> smart stuff. You always say smart stuff. <laughs> oh, I know. I said eat the chips. <laughs> yeah. Um. We. Again, just like the lotus in the mud, right? This, it's, we have a responsibility to ourselves, a sacred responsibility to ourselves to show up and give ourselves the nourishment we need most in any given moment. And sometimes that is not spiritually evolving, quote unquote, by someone yes. else's standards, right? Like today, spiritual evolution for me today is going to be to grab whatever and watch some, you know, catch up on a series I haven't finished or whatever, and not think about all the things. Um, I think it's possible for the, the very items that get labeled as the poison to actually be our medicine. Yeah. And and honestly, I think it's, it's, it's even beyond all right. It's, it's to be expected and it's needed. And why would we withhold that from ourselves? Why would we withhold the very nourishment we need in a given moment? Because it doesn't uphold some, as you said earlier, commodified version yeah. of yoga, right? Like what is yogic well i i think potato chips are yogic yeah yeah scrolling but, tiktok can be totally yogic right like if we are in really honest and loving relationship with ourselves which i see yoga as a liberation practice that's what it's about it's about yes. freedom the, this is the only plane myself, my body, my experience, my, me as this expression of the divine is, um, is really the only space I can liberate and I can be supportive of everyone else's liberation, but really only when I've liberated myself first yes. and only in the ways that I have liberated myself. So liberating myself from judging and punishing myself because I decided that I wanted a bowl of chips and scrolling through some Instagram or TikTok, that is a liberation practice right there, right? I'm liberating myself from my own self-punishment, my own self-sabotage, my own self, whatever. Yes. And I'm choosing self-devotion. I've really been thinking a lot about tapas in relationship to devotion, as opposed to like discipline or commitment lately. Yeah. Because discipline, self-discipline and commitment can be so loaded in our culture, right? They're very like checklisty, one and done, um, pun it. Like, I think it's, it's pejorative. People feel like it contracts you, right? Like you think self-discipline and you're like, you like curl up in on yourself, right? And my, my best experience of yoga is the moments, even when I feel the crappiest, where I can find just a little space of expansion, a little more room than I had before, right? Like the best binding asana practice in the whole wide world is the one where you're like, wait, I can kind of roll my shoulder a little bit, even though the rest of me feels like I'm in a pretzel right now, right? Like that's the beauty of the bind. That's yeah. the beauty of the deep twist. And, um, and so why like so i've shifted my relationship to it to be about devotion and because that feels expansive to me right okay. like if i am devoted to myself then i'm going to eat the chips yeah oh i love that so much tanya just <laughs> so i mean it's so it's so absolutely true and really resonates for me and and part of it is that i feel like i grew up i i will say i grew up Midwest. So Midwesterners tend to be people who are austerity is a virtue signal very clearly in our culture. I also grew up Catholic. So self-flagellation is also a virtue signal in this culture that I was raised in. So when I slid into yoga as, you know, a 19 year old young woman, all of the things that said, 
take away and don't, you know, like all of the things that were punishments for me felt normal because that's how I was raised. And it really took me sliding into a, a point of neutrality. Like what if I just look, yoga, yoga asana is a nervous system regulator. Meditation is a nervous system regulator. So is TikTok, so is chips. So is, you know, so is a glass of wine at night. What if they're all neutral? What if instead of choosing based on what is good or bad, I'm choosing based on the results I want after I've consumed whatever it is. Like you had said, chips maybe aren't my thing anymore, like because you're choosing your results. And I, I feel like for us, especially within the yoga profession, this is a conversation we absolutely have to have because in order for us to be leaders, if we don't think about this, then we have to be the best self punishers. Like, like if we're leading a group of people and we're supposed to be the po folks people are looking up to, if we embrace this idea of austerity and self-flagellation, then that's what we have to be the best at. Like, that's dumb. And no wonder we <laughs> think about quitting every six months. I know, <laughs> true, true story, right? <laughs> I don't do that. I still think about quitting every six months. <laughs> I think that's just a healthy relationship. <laughs> it's, it's true with, with anything, with, yeah. but I, I don't want to, I don't want that for us. No. I, mm -mm. <laughs> and I like, I'll take it even further and say that if that's what we think leadership is, and that's the walk we're walking, then we can't be there for each other either. Yes. So, you know, when you walk out of the bathroom and you're trailing toilet paper behind your skirt, um, I can't walk up to you and say, hey, Rebecca, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that it would be a potentially it would be embarrassing to you, which would put me in an awkward position because now I'm I'm pointing out a a space in which you are not the, the picture of perfection and people pleasing programming. And I'm acknowledging at the same time that like, I might have some toilet paper streaming out behind me too. <laughs> yeah. And so we, it's an additional barrier that we put. Um, it's, it's like we built ramparts around ourselves and between each and every one of us, right? How can we possibly be a community? How can we really lead a community in the way that I imagine community to feel and look and, and be um, if we keep separating ourselves out? And then by that very tone, as I say those words, is that not the ultimate giving into the illusion that we are hoping to dissolve through study of and practice of the yoga wisdom tradition. And no wonder we love throwing stones at each other. It's literally the only way we can connect over the big damn walls we've got between each yeah. other. Of exactly. course. You know, screaming, yelling, yeah. throwing stones, right? Sending up balloons and flares. None of it builds anything. It's all yeah. destructive ultimately. And we feel trapped in that cycle. And now like to circle all the way back to your analogy at the beginning of, you know, the house on fire and all that's left now is the, is the um, nails. What are we going to do with those nails? Like we have an opportunity here because those walls have been burned to the ground, right? Yes. Like whether anyone's admitting it or not, we all know that each of us is we've gone through something like we've gone through something real. And um, everyone has, whether they are involved in yoga or not. And our industry itself is also completely evolving right now, right? It is, it is yes. rising like a phoenix from the ashes. And what are we going to do with this opportunity? How are we going to, how are we going to use these connective devices of nails to bring us together, um, to build the bridges? that we can cross to each other rather than re-erecting the walls that kept us divided before. Yeah. Build our foundation, create a roof, but the walls are okay coming down. I like that we can see each other. I like that I no longer feel 
anger and frustration towards the quote unquote asana only fitness yoga professionals. Like it feels better in my body when I think about saying, welcome, I'm proud to co-create our future with you. Like yeah. it's not- Thank you just, for the work you do. Yes, thank you. Without you, there's no me. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, like, oh. Yeah. Okay, we're going to end there and I'm going to have you tell everybody, Tanya, where to find you and your amazing membership. I know you've got a membership going on and, and all kinds of things. So tell everybody where to find you. Well, they can connect with me on social media at a soulful space, all squished together. And um, I, my, my whole world is evolving right now. And so I work largely in the virtual world uh, now. So I have a virtual healing art studio and I am just getting a new um, membership kind of off the ground. It'll first, its first public appearance will probably be March of 2023. Um, we're doing a lot of behind the scenes invitation, working with my current community right now to build a nice solid foundation yeah. um, and notice where the walls are so that we can <laughs> not have them, right? Have the roof, have the foundation, and then just have this really beautiful space where people are just free to come and be themselves. Um, yeah. I see, gosh, if I can give no other gift to the to anyone other than to let them show up as they are, messy or not, happy or not, like all of the things, um, let us be complex because I really feel that that's what the future is, is calling on us to do, is to stop flattening ourselves out. And as um, as spiritual teachers, like, for me, as someone who's sort of in the last year and a half, I have very firmly stepped into the role as spiritual teacher, which I may not have done before. I would have hesitantly, <laughs> right? Um, and I see it now as like, this is the space that I'm willing, I'm, I'm equipped to occupy and, uh, and that is to acknowledge that it's messy. Yes. It's complex. It's, there are rainbows, there are butterflies, and there's a whole lot of other stuff too. And, um, you know, and sometimes it's really hard to appreciate the butterfly because you're just like, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to be happy yeah. today. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm cranky and I'm going to be cranky. <laughs> And, and I think that, you know, extending ourselves that grace is so valuable and extending it to everyone else is like, what a gift, right? If we could all just be with each other what exactly a gift. as we are, what a gift. Uh, go follow Tanya on at a soulful space on Instagram. She does lovely Instagram lives and videos that I want you to go check out right now. Thank you so much for this conversation, Tanya. It felt so nourishing for me. I'm grateful that you came here today. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for the opportunity. I loved the conversation. Now you've got my, my juices flowing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Tanya, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I loved our conversation. Make sure I'll, make sure that y'all go follow Tanya on Instagram at a soulful space or on her website, www.asoulfulspace.com. And you'll hear from Tanya this summer as she joins me on our Friday Night in Lights panel, panel at the virtual retreat that my yoga studio, Sunlight Yoga and Apothecary, is hosting. You all are welcome to come. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.